Americans love using their credit cards, the most secure and hassle-free way to pay. But DC politicians want to change that with the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. This bill lets corporate megastores pick how your credit card is processed, allowing them to use untested payment networks that jeopardize your data security and rewards. Corporate megastores will make more money, and you pay the price. Tell Congress to guard your card, because Americans lose when politicians choose. Learn more at GuardYourCard.com. What is up and welcome to another edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker, your host. Make sure you guys are liking and subscribing the podcast. We are brought to you guys today by our advertisers. Our advertisers are Bell to Bell Fitness, Shator, a realtor out in Arizona, former Bruin alum, and my main man, Howard Chang, a realtor right here in Los Angeles. Let's go through them, guys. Uh, Bell to Bell Fitness is a boxing gym on the West Coast used by their FIT acronym, Fight Inspired Training. My main man, Tony Gonzalez, was the boxing coach for UCLA for over 10 years. He has built this gym on the west side to learn how to box and stay in shape and get you all the essentials you need to become somebody that is obsessed with boxing and fitness. Make sure to check it out. Go into Bell to Bell Fitness and say you heard about it from the Bruin Bible, and you're going to get a free session with Tony Gonzalez. So make sure to check that out. Shea Tor, my main man. Shea Tor is a, real, a licensed real estate agent in Arizona and a lifelong Bruin. He's a current Wooden Athletic Fund donor and football season ticket holder. When not selling houses or going to UCLA games, he loves to travel the country, checking out different arenas, ballparks, and stadiums. If you're looking to make the move to Arizona or know someone who is, please reach out to our loyal friend, Mr. Shea Tour. His phone number is 602-487-3975. Once again, his number is 602-487-3975. Make sure to check that out. And then the local realtor we got out here, Howard Chang. Howard Chang is a local realtor with the Serene team at EXP Realty. Their team has an office right here in Culver City, though they help clients buy and sell homes all over the L.A. County and the surrounding areas. Howard and his team do a ton of business and are super in tune with the market, knowing winning strategies to give their clients a competitive advantage, have amazing vendor referrals, are a one-stop shop for anything real estate, and just provide a ton of value for their clients. Howard and his partner, Kyle Draper, are UCLA alums and a huge, huge fans of the UCLA football and basketball programs. You often see them at games tailgating and networking and staying involved with the UCLA alumni community. They would love to help any fellow alumni with accomplishing their real estate goals. So if you guys have any real estate needs in the LA area, look no further. Howard is your guy. All right, guys, we're going to go into the episode. What is up, y'all? And welcome out to the Bruin Bible a somber episode, if you will, on a Sunday where UCLA just got decimated in their inaugural game in the Big Ten, 42-13, to 13, and it wasn't particularly close. I mean, you snapped your fingers, and we were down 21 nothing in this game. Three of the first four drives going for touchdowns. I made the joke to you earlier that Curtis Rourke looked like Nick Patty looked in that Sun Bowl game. <laughs> I mean, 300 plus yards, turnover free football. Um, you know, four touchdown passes. This guy was on one. We had talked pregame about how good of a coach Signetti is, and they showed a stat on the CBS, uh, the, the NBC broadcast, where he is top five in terms of coaching winning percentage at fifty-two and nine. I think Ryan Day and one and other Kirby. Company. Yep, and Kirby. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's pretty elite company. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Not bad. <laughs> you know, I. I want to give a lot of credit to Kurt Signetti and that team, but there's also a lot to talk about with how poorly coached this team looked last night, how unprepared they had with Madman a week to prepare for this game. Like there's no excuses on the table for this team. They let up over 500 yards of total offense and Madman, I hate to say it, man. Usually, you know, when the referees get involved to kind of help out UCLA, there's a chance there There was maybe the most bogus rushing the passer call I've ever seen on Ethan Garbers. A couple questioning, questionable targeting calls, Madman. Here was how the penalties shook out. 14 penalties, you know, for Indiana for 127 yards compared to just seven for 70, uh, 74 yards for UCLA. They nearly doubled the amount. So you had that in your favor with a lot of, you know, you're at home for the first time. You had a week to prepare, as I mentioned previously. And you get just – you get your ass kicked. There's no two ways to say it. Just a, a bloodbath for UCLA football. Talk to me about your reaction to the game, and then I want you to follow up that question with, in your mind, who is the most to blame 
for UCLA and their embarrassing start. And guys, I hate to say it's not going to get better from here on out. Our next three games are, you know, LSU at Baton Rouge, Oregon. We come home, we play Oregon, and then Penn State. It's not going to get better. I thought this team had a shot at a bowl game this year. And boy, am I just, you know, fixing my statements at this point because it looks really brutal to watch UCLA Madman. So take the floor. Yeah, Thriller. I mean, obviously, this is uh... – I mean, I'm I'm a little bit without words because this is the least positive outcome you could have had, right? It's there was, hey, this is a game that is a is a winnable game, particularly given the stretch that you mentioned. And then over the course of the week, we talked about UCLA going from kind of expected to win to being an underdog. The line went from two and a half to three to three and a half at kickoff. Uh, so you know, you and I both had. UCLA kind of prevailing by three. I believe you were 27, 24. I was 30 to 27. We thought it would be a wildly competitive game. Uh, but to lose, not just, you know, getting the L on the board, but in the fashion and the manner that it was, is what is so disheartening, perplexing. And it just makes you wonder this program is back at the studs level in, in terms of being able to need to to rebuild. And, and Will, I go back to sort of our conversations over the course of the week on this show. Uh, we, what did we say? We said there were kind of two elements here. This was going to be a game that was going to be played on the first level of the defense and the third level of the defense, right? We said the linebackers are going to be more in containment mode. They're going to be more in supplement mode. But this is all going to be about the pass rush and the ability to generate a pass rush and the ability to defend uh, that dynamic offense on the back end. And if you look at how this game played out, you talked about Rourke, I mean, 25 for 33, 307 yards, four touchdowns. He was peppering it all over the place. But Will, the two key stats for me that just stand completely out, one is Indiana was nine for 12 on third down. They got anything that they wanted uh, in terms of from a third down perspective. Many of those were third and longs, third and sevens, third and nines. More than half of them were what we would characterize as third and long. And then the second key statistic was zero sacks. And so when you're talking zero sacks and you're going nine for 12 on third down and you've got a quarterback that completed nearly 80% of his passes and clean sheet, four touchdowns, 300 plus yards, that tells you the first level of the defense got absolutely boat raced the third level of the defense got absolutely boat raced. And so the keys uh, from a defensive perspective and a scheme perspective uh, just came to bear there. And then when you flip flip it on the other side, Will, offensively, we thought there would be momentum that would be generated from the second half of that Hawaii game. And you said it best, Will. It Off of a bye, you know, two weeks to prepare. And the very first play that UCLA had the ball – there was a miscommunication between Ethan Garbers and TJ Harden of whether or not that was going to be a pass or a run. Garbers thought it was a pass. Harden thought it was going to be a run. Harden's elbow pops the ball out, and Indiana dives on it after their opening drive, and boom, you know, it was 14 nothing right off the bat. How does that happen to a team that had two weeks to prepare, sitting on the sideline? You, you're getting the first 8-10 to 10 play scripted. How does that possibly happen? And then going through... Uh, this particular game will, I mean, outside of, you know, that touchdown drive at the end of the first half where Garber scrambled for 20, there was a little bit of a, another pop play to Flores for 22, found Matavao for 15. And then that first maybe screen pass in the third quarter to TJ, I mean, there was nothing offensively at all to speak of uh, over the course of these four quarters. And so, you just wonder right now in terms of coaching, where is this team mentally right now uh, from a preparation perspective? Deshaun Foster had two weeks to prepare in this opener and yeah. you lose by 30. And we had Eric the enemy's sort of vaunted offense, quote unquote, and it's put up 14 and a half points, Will, over two games. And so you, you got nothing to really hang your hat on offensively. You got nothing to really hang your hat on defensively. These were presumably the first two easiest games of the schedule. You walk out of here one and one, barely. I mean, if, if Hawaii doesn't sort of uh, commit some self-inflicted penalties, you could be walking out of here 0 and 2. You and I have talked about this gauntlet. Look, let's lay it out there, Will. This is 1 and 4. Let's just sort of 
let's put that out there. I mean, oh, the, the, the probability yeah. of of this team being able to win any one of these next three games, I got a better chance of getting hit by lightning. I mean, this is a one in four situation right now. And when you look at the ESPN FPI, the football probability index of every game from now until the end of the season, UCLA is an underdog in every game from now until the end of the season. So, Will, we're in a very challenging position here. Uh, all The honeymoon period with Deshaun Foster is clearly over. And we're now in a situation where things could get a lot worse uh, before they get better. Yeah, man. And there's a lot of areas to point the finger at in this game. I think, you know, where I would start directly would be just the immediate coaching staff. And you look at these successful programs within the Big Ten and what these coaching staffs are. And I'm not even going to mention to you the top of the line coaches like your Ryan Days, your James Franklin's, your Lincoln Riley's, whatever. Let me go through some of the coaches we have in this conference that are just average in this conference. Brett Bielema for Illinois. He's got them in the top 25 once again. This guy took Wisconsin to back-to-back Rose Bowls in the late 2000s. This is a very qualified head coach. Let's go to Matt Rule at Nebraska, a guy that has inherited, you know, two and one win teams from Temple and Baylor and took them to perennial 10-11 win teams when he was done there at the college level. He succeeded everywhere he's been at the college level. Luke Fickle, who got his ass kicked this weekend against Alabama, my friend. This guy is a two-time national champion coordinator for Ohio State. And, I mean, he took Cincinnati to the 14 playoff, I mean, just two years ago. This is a really good coach. Kirk Ferentz, 11 straight bowl games. Like, this is what it is. And then even P.J. Fleck, a guy that the UCLA fan base, a large portion of them, scoffed at for us throwing this name out there. You know, five of the last six years, he's taken the Gophers to a bowl game with how bad the Minnesota Gophers program has been moving forward. And you look at what this team is comprised of. Deshaun Foster, first-time head coach, had never even had any coordinator experience in this position. I love Deshaun. I I think it was a huge miscalculation to just kind of accelerate from a running back coach to a head coach. It's not his fault. He did not make that decision. But for that decision from him to go to running backs coach, that's very different from calling the offensive plays, having some semblance, having control of one side of the football to go to the head coach right there. Okaika Malloy, first-time defensive coordinator, man. Like, he had never left the defensive line before this. And I trust me, I loved the D-line last year. I love the running backs room with Deshaun Foster. But it is so different when you're managing one position group to go into running the entire show on the defense or the whole team in general. And then you have Eric Bieniemy, man. And we talked ourselves into this for the love of the Chiefs and what they've been able to kind of breed at the football NFL level, right? Two Super Bowl championships. This is a team that has defined this era of football. But you know what, man? Andy Reid is arguably the second greatest coach of our of my lifetime watching football, only to the great Bill Belichick. The last time Eric Bieniemy was an offensive coordinator at the college level was Colorado in 2011 and 2012. And do you want to hear what those last. total offenses went? Yeah. Do you want to hear what those last. total offenses went? Yeah. 109th and 120th. And you have to remember this was before expansion of Division One. There was 124 teams nationally. So he ranked in the bottom 15 offenses for those two years at Colorado and then went back to the Chiefs. It's easy to look good standing next to a genius, but when you got to do it on your own, it's a little bit different. So there's a lot of concern there, Madman, when it comes to that coaching staff. I know everybody wants to get on Martin Jarman, and there's a lot of reason – as to why the Chip Kelly situation was incredibly weird, Madman. We talked about it. You know, this was the four-game stretch that occurred last year. They lose to a, albeit, a very good Arizona team when it came to the end of the season last year, 27-10. to 10. We can give them that W. The following week, they lose 17-7 to 7 to Arizona State with no quarterback for ASU. Colin Schley is out there. We're sending text messages going like, what the hell is going on out there? Bryce Pierre, who is our tight end now, was playing a lot of those snaps at quarterback for Arizona State, and we still lost the game. Unexcusable loss. Then we go and beat USC, 38-20. to 20, And this is not even just a blanket statement. This is not even overreaction. That was the worst defensive USC team I've seen in my lifetime. In my lifetime. That should not count as a victory in any couple of ways. I know they had Caleb Williams out there. I know it was the rivalry game. Congrats for beating a team. 
that couldn't keep their hold their jock strap on the defensive side of the football. And then, I mean, the magnum opus of these losses, Madman. The 33 to 7 game to little brother Cal to close out the regular season. I mean, just abysmal. We're all calling for Chip Kelly's head. And I want to show this article because I think this will present a lot of what a lot of people are saying. You can blame Martin all you want for this, but here's the reality of the situation. I'm going to scroll down for you guys on this one. UCLA's athletic department was already on tenuous financial footing. It has run up a $167.7 million debt since the fall year of 2019 and recently was ordered by the University of California Regents to pay $10 million per year to them. So with that being said, Mad Mad, a lot of people are going after Jarman's head right now. But there's also a guy that was ahead of him, the, the chancellor at the time, that I think with the calimony payments, with that enormous debt, and I know we're buying different spots around, you know, for that for this this university to try to add to the place. But man, when you're 170 million in debt, there's not a whole lot you can do. And I think that was kind of a way that Chip and Martin were able to work that out, where it came down to the point where it's like. Chip, I know you want to leave. We don't want you to be here either. Let's find the best way to do this so we don't have to pay the $8.5 million that we owe you. And eventually, Chip, leaves for Ohio State, $1.5 million paid for it. Listen, his buddy's Ryan Day. I'm sure they go out and pay for it. So there's a lot of you know places at hand here that you could point the blame to, Madman. Long story short. But I just think... The coaching staff is inadequate, and I think a large portion of that was we could not fire Chip Kelly when we wanted to. Are any of those statements fair? And I just want to hear your thoughts on what I just you know laid out for everybody. Yeah, Will. I mean, it's it's a great layout. You know, I'm, I'm glad you provided the context. I mean, let's take it kind of step by step here. You know, first step. You know, let's talk about Deshaun. I, I think we we both love Deshaun as as a Bruin. We've had the opportunity to spend time with Deshaun at an individual level. Uh, you know, truly bleeds UCLA, great alum. I think there's a world where he can grow into this job in the future and be successful down the line, but he's just not there yet. It, it's obvious. He's in over his head. He's he's not ready for this job. I mean, this is a double promotion. This is like in the equivalent in the corporate world. You go from a manager to a vice president, you know, and you yeah. skip being a director or, you know, you, you go from director to being CEO you skip being vice president. I mean, it's it's such a massive jump to go from a positional coach to be the the head coach of a program, to be the CEO of a program. And we've seen it at, at every step of the way, Will. You know, he, strugg he struggled with the media time and again. He struggled with execution, play calling these first two games. He's just struggled with the overall just plan and strategy and preparation moving forward. He's in over his head. It's obvious. Now, he's hired Eric Bieniemy. He's hired Malloy. He was obviously in a tough situation. To your point, he himself was only hired end of January, early February because of the, the Chip Kelly saga, right? And, you know, Chip, uh, so much of that conversation was, should he have gotten fired? He should have gotten fired earlier. Why didn't he get fired earlier? Um, you know, given the roller coaster of last season, that was the case. And then the question becomes, well, then, you know, the person who has hired Deshaun Foster, the person who ultimately has to put this team together from, uh, you know, a decision making perspective is Martin Jarman. But then you look at Martin Jarman and you say, you know, Martin Jarman's a young athletic director. This is really his first big time AD job. You know, he was there at Boston College, but this is his first time big AD job. He's inherited a whole debt situation. Um, and it was sort of his idea to move UCLA to the Big Ten in the first place to sort of get out of this debt situation, you know? And so, uh, you know, so much to unpack here, Will. But I'm really glad that you went all the way to the chancellor level because I really want that to be where this conversation is because that's where it appropriately needs to be, Will. You know, the same folks that are sort of clamoring for Deshaun to get fired were the same folks that wanted a chip to get fired and the same folks that wanted more to get fired and new Heisel to get fired and Durrell to get fired. And the same people that are saying Martin Jarman should get fired are the same people that saying Dan Guerrero should have gotten fired. You know, at some point 
you know, it's a very limiting response. You know, you can't fire everybody. At some point, you have to sort of look inside the mirror and say, if our answer to everything is just fire this person and fire this person, fire that person, and everything is going to be okay, it is a symptom. It's not the cause. And the cause ultimately will, and this is where it gets existential, it gets deep, it gets raw, it gets real. It comes down to how much does UCLA want to play top end football from a university perspective? How much of a priority is it? And I'll, I'll lay it out in this way, Will. Chancellor Charles Young was the chancellor for UCLA for 29 years, from 1968 to 1997. He's regarded as a visionary chancellor in the history of UCLA. He understood the value of sports and the value of football on how it plays in terms of the vitality of the university overall, whether it's applications, whether it's funding, whether it's, you know, just positioning uh, strategically. He understood the value of football and of sports overall to that entire ecosystem. Chancellor Young's last year at UCLA was 1997. UCLA's last year in football, when they were when they won the conference and made national noise, was 1998. That is not a coincidence. And we went from Chancellor Young to Chancellor Albert Carnicell, who didn't share that vision of, of the importance of football. He wanted UCLA to be the Harvard of the West, the, the public Harvard, if you will, of the West, and really kind of took away some of the policies and the mechanics and the philosophy around making sports important. And then he was chancellor for seven or eight years. And then Chancellor Gene Block was more of a status quo person off of what the previous administration was. And you've seen it, Will. Over the last 26 years, UCLA football has three 10-win seasons. And two of those 10-win seasons were directly related to the fact that the team across town was on sanctions and UCLA had a much wider recruiting pipeline than they normally would. This ultimately, Will, comes down to the top. This is about the chancellor, the chancellor's priorities, and the people that put the chancellor in power, those selection committees. How much do they value football? And we have a new chancellor that is starting January 1st, Will, Julio Frank, who comes from the University of Miami, which has a historic football program. The question is going to be, at 72 years old, how much does he want to emphasize football? Because ultimately, the degree to which he will emphasize football, then everybody around the chancellor makes that a priority. And Will, we never like to compare, but just take an example across town. Carol Folt, president of USC, she has four moonshots in terms of her tenure. Athletics is one of them. She literally has said athletics is one of her four moonshots. She's laid it out there. It's very clear. It's very obvious. When you look at the Michigans and the Texases and the Ohio States and the Alabamas and down the line they go, look at how important football is to sort of the ethos of that culture. You wonder, where does UCLA stand in terms of how important football is? It starts with the chancellor and then the people around the chancellor buy into that philosophy. And when they buy into that philosophy, Will, that's when you go get top donations for football that's when you hire the top athletic directors that's when you hire the top coaches and that's when it just becomes this domino effect of of dominance you know and when you don't value it this is sort of what happens you have guys and and gals that are in positions that perhaps they're a little too young for they're not quite ready for and they're inheriting very difficult situations so to me will this isn't necessarily about fire this person or fire that person because we've been saying it for 20 years. We've been wanting to fire everybody uh, three or four years. You know, it's deeper than that. You know, at some point, you know, the, the age old saying goes, you know, when you when you sort of break up, hey, it's not you, it's me. You know, it's, I mean, at some point you have to say, look, this is me. This is a me problem. I, how many times can we keep going back to the well of saying we're just one hire away? You just got to fire this person. It really comes down to, to the chancellor, the leadership. Leadership starts at the top. You set the direction of the organization. How badly does UCLA want to be a, a, a player, a power, a dominant force in football? And, and the answer over the last 25 years, the last quarter century, Will, is mediocrity is acceptable for the football program. This is a basketball school. As long as they put a winning record together and beat USC, that's considered a success. And if that's the success... Let's just share that and say that's what success is for football. 
But if we want more, it has to start from the top. Yeah, and I mean, you alluded to the point I was about to bring up. It just seems like they have those horses blinders on where it's how have we done against USC? And for the last 15 years, I believe it's been close to 500 within that series. So there's been consistent winning on both sides for UCLA and USC in these certain situations. And I mean, it, it begs, it begs the question, like let's flip that score from last year. It was 38, 20 UCLA. If it's 38, 20 USC, I actually think chip, there's no choice, but to fire chip Kelly, but just the reaction that was shared there, you know, Martin coming in the locker room after the game with the victory bell, them touting it. They brought it to the basketball game. I remember you were at the game then the following, you know, Tuesday after the Saturday game, and they brought the bell in and they were excited. And there's a lot of that to the rivalry games, but it just begs the question, man, like how serious do we want to take this? And you saw this alumni association rally when it came to basketball this offseason. I mean, Mick Cronin was raving about it. He goes, and I think it's like a direct quote from the article in the LA Times. He goes, look at our recruiting class compared to last year. There's no secret science to this. It's NIL. Like, this is exactly what's happened. We got the All-American late with Trent Perry. We had the number one transfer portal class. And what breaks my heart, man, is like for a university that has national championships with them, Heisman Trophy winners. You know, dude, I was throwing on the highlights, 1998 Texas against UCLA, Cade McNown. We're beating Texas. Like, 49-31. I even remember the score, Will. (laughs) Unbelievable. Like, you know, and we all remember the Miami game, you know, for the BCS that kind of cost us a shot at the national championship. It's just one of those things where this program has been historic for so long. And, I mean, I'm watching Sunday football again today. Carson Steele making impact plays for the Chiefs. Charbonnet got a touchdown today. Like, we have guys that make an impact within the league and onwards within the football program. It just seems to think, you know, for for me, that this university has planted its flag on basketball, and that's where they're moving forward, which is very unfortunate because this team should not be bad, Madman. Like, I always reference this point from our guy Bill Conley. Uh, ESPN, he's like a statistician when it comes to college football. We brought back 70% of our productive talent from last year. Yes, we lost Law to who's irreplaceable. I'll be the first to admit it. Mwasa was huge. Murphy twins. Outside of those four guys, we pretty much bought everyone back and then upgraded some positions due to the transfer port. Off of an eight-win team that won a bowl game last year. You know what I mean? So there was a lot of, the, the the statement that we don't have talent, I think that's no, BS. that's uh, totally false. That's yep. That's completely BS. I I think we are so poorly coached right now yeah. that we don't stand a chance in a conference where not only do the trenches matter, which is our you know one of our weaker points, but I just laid it out, man. These coaches are next, even like Greg Schiano. Like this guy was an NFL head coach. He revived Rutgers himself. He's back at Rutgers. Like there, the level of coaching in this conference is not 2021 Pac-12, where it was Kyle Whittingham and everybody else. You have Herman Edwards and like Jake Dickard. Yeah, you could probably scheme up against those guys. These guys are a little bit different. I'm just. I'm just at a loss for words, Mad Mad. So it's no thriller. I mean, it's it's a it's a great point. And I want to I want to double click on a couple of things that you said. One is the most painful part for me last night wasn't the score. It wasn't the outcome. It wasn't even the coaching. The most painful point for me last night was with five minutes left in the game, and Indiana had the ball, and you could hear the chance of yeah. goodbye from the Indiana fan base in your home opener. And that that set it all right there because there was about 47,000 in attendance. Well, I think it might have been 60-40 UCLA, Indiana, but there was a lot of red out there yesterday. And obviously there was a lot made about moving the student section and making it more centralized and, you know, some sections that the student section felt a little kind of spread out, a little diluted, and it just, that pained me more than anything else because it showed that, you know, the, the attendance, the engagement, the passion will yet again is waning very deeply. And you you said something great, Will, when you think about UCLA basketball, this is now a top three NIL program in basketball. I mean, it's Kentucky, Duke, UCLA. Mick has gotten the reinforcements, the alums, 
both from the NBA as well as the very successful alums that UCLA has in all industries, but in entertainment and business here in Los Angeles and all over the world, they have ponied up. UCLA is going to be a power in basketball yet again for years to come, be perennial top three, top five, final four, threatening for the national championship every year. And I think what has happened, Will, you mentioned, I grew up on those teams, Will, the 20 straight, that's the team I grew up on, okay? I was I was 12, 13 years old for the 20-game win streak, 97, 98 with Cade and Deshaun and Danny Farmer and Freddie and Brian Pulley Dixon and, and all those guys. That's the team I grew up on. and. The world has changed, Will, you know, since 98. I mean, that was, we talk about Chancellor Young's last year was 97, and that was 98. That was Terry Donahue's last recruiting class. That was his last uh, recruiting class that became seniors. And after the mid, the late 90s, Will, as the salary cap and free agency exploded in the NFL and it became much more about money, monetary outcomes, this went away from being just a regional sport. You know, and then with the advent of the BCS, you had the guarantee of number one versus number two. You had the national championship. It became much more of a national sport and it became much more of a financial sport. And what that meant was that you had to level up. You had to put even more into it. Remember, Will, we talked so much about, you know, we talk about NIL today. What was the big investment 10 years ago, if you recall? It was facilities, if you remember, right? I mean, it's like who's got the best football centers and the best football complexes. And fortunately, UCLA, thanks to Casey Wasserman, has stayed uh, very, very relevant and at the top end there. But it takes so much more effort now and, and resources and money and time and passion to stay on top. And, Will, that's just going to continue over time. In the 80s and the 90s, UCLA could, when it was more regional, when the money wasn't just bonkers in the NFL, you could rely more on just being UCLA, being the best school, having the best campus, having the best weather, the best academics, all of those things. Nowadays, these kids are not just coming to a university. They're coming to a football program. They are majoring in football. And so the emphasis and the resources has to just be so much greater. And we've kind of, you know, been neutral. We've kind of put one, one leg in the toe and then put it back out. And it takes both feet in the pool both arms in the pool, your face in the pool, and you have to go absolutely all in. And so one of the first things that Chancellor Julio Frank is going to have to decide is how realistic is it for UCLA to be able to go all in on basketball and football, given where this thing is going from an NIL perspective, a transfer portal perspective, a revenue share perspective, the professionalization of college sports perspective, as well as the preservation of the other Olympic sports that I know mean very much to the UCLA community. And so the answer to that question may be, hey, we may just have to kind of go all in on basketball and, and be sort of, you know, flatlining a bit on football. As long as it's a winning record, that's considered success. Or if you want to go all in because you can, you are UCLA, it can happen. You know, a school like Michigan is able to kind of go in both. They got a great basketball program. They got a great football program. UCLA and Michigan are eerily similar Alabama. in terms of uh, academics, in terms of culture, in terms of resources. I mean, eerily similar. So you can do it. You can go all in. But it's not going to be off of the playbook that you have right now. It's going to take a whole transformation of the athletic department in terms of priority and strategy and focus. But that transformation can only be told from through the top. So it's going to be fascinating here, Will. The new chancellor is going to have to decide how much of a football program this is going to be. Yeah, man, it's it's frustrating on a lot of different fronts. And, you know, I just want to say, man, it's it's going to be a long, rough year. And I just want fans to buckle their seatbelts for what is about to transpire. You know, it's it's going to be I mean, we're going to lose this next three games in my I, I don't think we have any chance the way we've looked. We've scored two offensive touchdowns in two games. Like, I don't see us going into Death Valley and winning. I don't see us against Oregon. Even after that, though, like Rutgers, they're just a well-coached team, which we are not right now. And they had a top 20 total defense last year. I'm favoring Rutgers in that game. I'm favoring Minnesota. I think the last question I'm going to leave you off with is for Deshaun Foster in the fan base's mind to keep his job. And I'm, I'm throwing out bowl game because I don't think it's going to happen. We had Indiana Pennsylvania as a win. Kurt Signetti is a phenomenal coach. We give him a lot of credit. 
But we had this penciled in as a win when they had 31 new transfers coming in compared to us returning 70% of our talent. What is a reasonable win-loss record for UCLA if Deshaun Foster is going to keep his job in the eyes of UCLA fans and be encouraged going into 2025? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And and to your earlier point, I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. You know, the first is this is absolutely a coaching problem right now because I'm just going to double and triple down on what you said, Will, just to try and debunk any sort of mythology that is out there on social media because I've been hearing things about, oh, you know, Chip kept the cupboard so bare and, you know, we have to sort of inherit that nonsense, nonsense, absolute nonsense. You're talking about Ethan Garbers, who's been four years in this program, uh, a a very experienced quarterback, someone you saw light up the L.A. Bowl last year, someone you saw beat USC last year as your signal caller. You've got two very viable running backs in T.J. Harden and Keegan Jones, who have both been deeply successful wearing UCLA colors over the past several years. You have the deepest wide receiver room we have ever had, okay, when you talk about... J. Michael Sturdivant, Rico Flores, Titus, Logan Loya, the leading receiver of last year's team, can't even start on this team. That's how deep the wide receiver room is. And then when you flip it to the other side, you still have that interior powerful tandem and Jay Toia and Keanu Williams. You have Olegijo, Medrano, Ali Kehau in terms of the linebacking room with John John Vons. And then you got guys in the secondary like Kirkwood, like Davies. You said it, Will, time and again. Addison is a guy that Oregon fans were salivating over and were very upset that he left. There is plenty on this team. Granted, the edge is a problem. Granted, the offensive line is a problem. But outside of that, there is plenty on this team to do a heck of a lot more than what is going on right now. So this is absolutely a coaching problem and not a talent problem. And Will, with that as the context, how do we look at the re- remainder of this season? Look, I'm going to kind of look at it from a reverse perspective. You know, sitting at one and one, we've talked about it. These next three, it's not going to happen. Oh. 22 and a half point underdog at LSU. Um, and then, you know, Oregon, Penn State, you're talking about teams that are, these are playoff teams. These are teams that are trying to vie for, you know, seeding to go and win a national championship. And with the way the coaching is, it's one and four. I have to put the other quote-unquote games that you're you're punching above your weight. I think at Nebraska is going to be a very a difficult game. It's going to be in that type of situation. Riola looks like the real deal. Matt Rule, that crowd. I mean, for God's sakes, Will, Nebraska has sold out every home game since like World War II. I mean, you know, that's going to be a very difficult game. And then it pains me, you know, to say this uh, from a UCLA perspective, a blue and, uh, you know, blue and gold, bleeding blue and gold. I, I think the SC game that, that there's a there's a a talent discrepancy there that I don't think is going to be able to be matched uh, this particular year w- when it comes to coaching. So you you sort of take those out and you say that's five games. So you're at six losses at that point. So now in order to make a bowl game, you got to kind of run the table on all these other games. Now how realistic is that <laughs> where to where we sit right now? Unlikely. But I think what I'm looking for will. Uh, for Deshaun to be able to keep his job moving forward. I think the only scenario where he doesn't keep his job, Will, is if this thing goes to 1-11 and and we see no improvement whatsoever over the course of the season. I think even if we can see some improvement over the course of the season, he gets more comfortable as a coach. They start playing better. The games are more competitive. Even if it ends up 3-9, and 4-8, and eight, I think he comes back the next year. I think there's kind of an acknowledgement that this is sort of a this is sort of a multi-year process. So I think that short of this thing going, well, call me crazy, but short of this thing going 1-11, and 11, you know, and this just flatlining from here on out, I do believe Deshaun will be back next year. With the caveat being, does the chancellor, new chancellor in January say, these are unacceptable standards for UCLA? And if he does that, then all bets are off. But if we are assuming that it's going to be sort of business as usual, from a top level strategic perspective, then I would say short of kind of a one and eleven flat line, even if it's three and nine, four and eight, I, I do see Deshaun coming back next year. Yeah. And man, unfortunately, it's, you know, it's that, tough. but that's just where we are. Yeah, I, I feel it. 
I, I, I think this was as long as Martin is manning the ship, I think it's going to be a multi-year process with Deshaun. Granted that they just don't get embarrassed for the rest of the year, which, I mean, you just can't rule out at this point, given what transpired in the first two weeks. You know, I want to take it back to the other three coaches that came before Deshaun, whether it's New Eisel, whether it's Jim Mora, whether it's Chip Kelly, because we've talked about it. The chancellor that you previously mentioned leaves UCLA's football program. It kind of, you know, you can see it deteriorate year after year. Was there, I, you know, we, we talk often about Rick Neuheisel, him coming in here, putting the billboards up in L.A., bringing optimism to UCLA, getting recruiting classes. I'd say there was a lot of optimism with the Jim Mora years. You know, you mentioned those three tenure wins. You know, pretty much three of those were all with Jim Mora, you know, for right. those first three seasons there. And then the, just the hype around Chip Kelly coming in, I'm not talking about the end result. You know, I if you look back and you don't know what the future is in all three of those situations, I'd argue those three are very, very good hires at that time. It's just a, a matter of trying to get the brand of UCLA football back in the minds of fans and recruits that we are a serious program. And, buddy, it just doesn't feel like a serious program right now. Which right now, yep. Because, you know, we've been doing this for four years and we put a lot of time and effort into this. And when you see your team just get obliterated, on a Saturday night to a team that like won I mentioned, three games last year, <laughs> won three games last year. I know Signetti is fantastic. Like he is a great coach, but they took in 31 new transfers from last year. Like from a familiarity standpoint, you know, of players playing together, UCLA had the advantage night and day in that. We, we talked about basically the whole offense comes back. Three offensive linemen, Garbers, both running backs, his top three receivers from like, there's so much, you know, communication and coordination between these guys that have been here before, but it, it's just so disheartening to see that. And that's why I believe it's just a flat out coaching issue right now. And there's nothing we could do. We have to wait this out. You know, I, I root for Deshaun Foster. This guy's a former absolutely. Bruin. We love Deshaun. Root- He's a great man. He's a great Bruin. Um, it's just a tough situation. Well, Will, I mean, it's it's like this. If I told you tomorrow, Will, you get you get the opportunity to be the CEO of Google tomorrow. You know, it's like. You'll be like, of course, I'll take it. Absolutely. But are you going to feel confident that you can sort of do the job after, you know, 24 or 48 hours? I mean, that's kind of the situation um, that Deshaun is in. And I don't think it was necessarily in a negative way. I think Martin sees potential. Martin sees, you know, what could be. I I think these are both very well-intentioned individuals that are very, you know, high character um, and, and care very deeply about the school. It just, it's just—it's a very tough predicament. And I'll, I'll go back to two things, Will. You, you mentioned about the, the last 25 years, the chancellors, why not? I think there were two inflection points where this thing could have been a little bit different. One is, I think if Rick got one more year, there is a world where New Heisel is still the coach of UCLA. Because everybody forgets, Brett Hundley was New Heisel's recruit. Mora didn't recruit uh, Hundley. Mora didn't recruit the talent from 2012 to 2014. That was New Heisel. Mora won with New Heisel's players. And the moment Mora had to win with his own players is when the the thing sank. And so Rick New Heisel had that secret sauce because he cared so deeply about UCLA and because he had such a deep history he was head coach many times. Well, he won a Rose Bowl with Washington in 2001. Everyone forgets. Really great mix of experience and UCLA passion. There is a world today where if we just gave him one more year and let him have that 2012 year because he cared so much about Hundley, because he was such a good man, he did, he redshirted Hundley in 2011 because he thought he had 2012, and we let him go after 2011 because it was after the 50 to nothing debacle against SC. He just couldn't move forward. So there's a world there, Will, number one. And the number two inflection point, and this is where leadership matters and strategy matters. You sit down with Chip and you say, we're going to bring in a director of branding and comms. That person is going to run recruiting. That person is going to make all of the decisions on recruiting. You just say what you want. I want this type of player with this type of specifics, the this character, this height, this weight, this skill set. You give me your menu. You give me your menu on what you want, Chip. 
And we are going to entrust this person to go build a roster for you. It's almost a pro style situation, Will, where you've got a head coach and you've got a general manager. And you bring in a general manager to say, I'm going to build the roster, deal with the recruiting, and deal with the media for you. Can you imagine what, what, what that would be? What's the knock on Chip? Everybody wants to pile on Chip because he didn't recruit. He disengaged with the fans, but you can't argue with the mind on the field. So you say, let's double down on his strengths and all of his weaknesses, which I completely agree with. You put it into a general manager, but that takes leadership. That takes direction. And so those are the two inflection points, Will, that could have been slightly different. A little bit more patience with Rick and uh, looking at things outside of the box with Chip. Um, And so let's hope we learn from that and, and move forward. And I think they just, and it was part of luring him to UCLA, but I also think they gave Chip just too much power as a coach. I mean, the the funny thing is, you know, the Lincoln Riley, Alex Grinch dynamic was at Westwood before it was there. Jerry Azanero was there for three years. Exactly. And we talked about it was the same thing that happened to USC where it's like, boy, if this team could just get a top 60 to 70 defense, do you know how good this team could be? And that was the case. And Azanero, like Grinch, was Chip's buddy for a long time. And just the thing that breaks my heart is like, if they were in a better situation financially, just, I mean, I, this is why I still believe UCLA can be great, man. It's like, if you had offered these three people jobs right now, I know they would have taken it. Whether it was Jonathan Smith, who was born in Pasadena, you know, in Pasadena area, his reason for leaving Oregon state, he was as blatant as you could possibly be. He goes, you know, they're Michigan state's moving to a big time conference. I want to coach in a big time conference. That was not exactly the direct quote, but it was essentially what he said when taking the Michigan state job. You got Jed fish who wanted to be here. Oh, Jed fish. Oh my God. That's the one. Well, yeah. And you know, I know he lost in the apple cup, but give this guy time. I've seen it at Arizona. I've seen, I think he's going to build Washington into a top five team in the big 10 moving forward. There's a lot there. And then man, it's just, God, it's so frustrating on so many different levels. P.J. Fleck, I feel like, would have welcomed a change to Westwood as his kind of the momentum he's built up in Minnesota. It can only go so far. If you get that guy with that high energy, high level of recruiting, I think you bring him to UCLA, it's going to be a game-changing situation. So those three guys, I feel like, would have been all in on coming to Westwood had they been properly court. Even Kurt Signetti, like, who knows? This guy. No, Will, I'm I'm so happy that you mentioned – kind of the possibility of the hires because it's just so easy to keep going to this sort of fire narrative, fire this person, fire that person and to tie it all the way back home. And I know we'll, we'll get out here soon. Will the reason we were in debt is because of the firing. I mean, it was the premature firing of Mora dead money, premature firing of Steve Alford in basketball, Under dead Armour. money, you know? So, this the the idea of just oh, let's go fire let's go fire let's go fire and everything's going to be fine there are implications there are deep financial implications when you keep having to do that this is where you get into debt and then this is where you have to sort of accommodate for that debt so it's much more complicated than just that that's why these are symptoms these are all symptoms of a much deeper problem and that is an existential one how much do we want to be great in football because all of the elements are there To your point, Will, there's a half a million alums who, if you resonate with them the right way, you can do it. There is a global brand. This is the number one public university in the country with the number one most beautiful campus in the country, with the number one best student life in the country, with the number one best cuisine in the country. You've got L.A. around it. You've got all you've got the history of great athletics. You have everything you need to be successful The question is, do you have the willingness to spend the time and have the courage to put all the resources together? Yeah. And, you know, to build off this point that Tony laid out, I agree in some circumstances, but if you might remember, we were a top three dining team last year. We were paying like a million (laughs) for nutrition on top of that. I mean, you look at the Wasserman Center. Granted, I mean, I just think most of the NIL is directed to basketball, which is unfortunate because I really think this football team could be something special if you just put the time and effort into it. Guys, thank you for tuning in. It's going to be a long season, but we're going to be there to report every step of the way. Stay with us, guys. There's light at the end of the tunnel. We're hoping for the best. Just stick it out, man. Fours up, Bruins. Basketball season is close, 
And we're going to be doing basketball this year full time, guys. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So stay tuned for that. I hope you guys have a great rest of your job. Americans love using their credit cards, the most secure and hassle-free way to pay. But D.C. politicians want to change that with the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. This bill lets corporate megastores pick how your credit card is processed, allowing them to use untested payment networks that jeopardize your data security and rewards. Corporate megastores will make more money, and you pay the price. Tell Congress to guard your card, because Americans lose when politicians choose. Learn more at GuardYourCard.com.